<laughs> All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My scripture is going to be coming from Ephesians chapter <coughs> 1, starting in verse 19 and going to 23. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power? which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. In the little town of Sardinia, Ohio, set in the southern part of the state, among the hills and valleys, a storm began to rage around the houses in each of the communities. The thunder roared and the lightning struck throughout the night as the storm slowly moved through the area. As the early morning approached, the noise began to overtake the sleeping patterns of those tucked away in their houses. And sooner than later, later the lights in the house began to flicker and before anyone knew it, the power was out. No light switch would work, the phone batteries and laptops began to die, and the noise of the air conditioning was gone. The house was silent and dark because there was no electricity. Why? Because the source of the power was out. As Christians, we don't have to fear that the source of our power will ever go out. We can live knowing that God's power will never run out. That even when a bad storm comes, it won't destroy the source of our power. In this passage of Ephesians, we can be assured of a simple truth today. And I want to take a moment to go through this. And let's first begin by looking at God's power. When I was around nine years old, we attended a decent-sized Baptist church in Hillsborough, Ohio. This was the place that I first came in contact with God and had asked Him to come into my life and save me. At, at this church, they would have what they called the power team that would come and visit, visit every year. This was a group of about seven to eight people that had certain powers. One man was so strong that with one strike of the elbow, elbow he could break a stack of eight bricks. Another man was big enough that he could take one lap around the church and run into a huge block of ice, breaking it without even hurting himself. Every one of these people had something that they could do that showed how powerful they were. And it was very intriguing to watch as they moved across the stage performing each powerful act. But it also made me realize something. If they have so much physical power, how much more power does God, the God that we serve, have? There are two phrases in verse 19 that I want to focus on that demonstrate the uniqueness of God's power. The first phrase is ex his exceeding greatness of his power, and the second phrase is his mighty power. These two phrases emphasize an important aspect of God's power. If you were to look at these words, they complement what is about to come. God's power isn't just great or just good. It's very great and very good. No other comp power compares to this power. No king, no president, no emperor, no ruler, or even a power team can say they have anything close to the power of God. He is above all that we can see. Sometimes it's easy to look around and to see the evil overtaking our world. It can seem as if Satan's power is winning and can be discouraging to even watch the daily news. But let me remind you today that this power will not last. Soon, God will demonstrate that exceeding great mighty power that we can see in Ephesians 19. And will destroy what we know as earth. All evil will be overtaken by God because no power can match his. God's power is incomparable to any other power. The second point in this passage that I want to look at is God's power through Christ. In verse 20 it says, 
which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. When Jesus died that cruel death on the cross, he did so and displayed God's power in him. Every sin, pain, disease, and death were conquered through God's power in Christ. In Jesus' resurrection, there is life eternal. In Jesus' resurrection, there is a glorified body that has been forever raised. In Jesus' resurrection, there is victory. In Jesus' resurrection, there is hope and new life. But how much power did it take to raise Jesus from the dead? A power that is incomparably great, like, as I talked about in the, in the last point. A power that has a mighty strength. Paul's second example of the incomparably great power and mighty strength of God at work is the event we remember today. Jesus raised into heaven and seated at the right hand of his Father. Now, we need to remember that the raising of Jesus was a three-stage process. It started when Jesus was raised into the cross. It continued when Jesus was raised from the dead. And it was completed when Jesus was raised into heaven. When Jesus ascended in, into heaven, it was God's incomparably great power and mighty strength at work. So, how much power did this take? When a space shuttle is launched into space... At the time of ignition, the ground shakes. Blast shields are up to protect the NASA ground crew, and the noise is tremendous. An unbelievable amount of energy is needed, so much that the launch rocket and the fuel tanks are more than twice as big as the shuttle itself. Now try to imagine that power needed to make a now try to imagine the power needed to make a body rise into heaven. There is no engine, no rockets, no fuel tanks, no ignition, no shaking of the ground, no blast shields. Even birds need to launch themselves into the air and flap their wings. But Jesus didn't have this. Jesus ascended in, into heaven without any of this. Je Jesus was simply raised into heaven through the incomparably great power and mighty strength of God. Our God is a mighty God. His power is incomparably great. And there were so many events that Paul could have used to select and selected it to show this power. He could have used God's creation to show God's power. He could have used the, the exodus when, out of Egypt, the tumbling down of Jericho's wall, the return from exile, Daniel and the lion's the many miracles that he performed in the Gospels. He could have used any of these. He could have used some of his own experiences to show God's power through Christ. Paul could have mentioned anyone and every one of these things to show the mighty power of God. But he did it. When t Paul talks about the power of God, what does he mention? He mentions and talks about the resurrection and the ascension. He talks about Jesus. As far as Paul is concerned, the mighty power of God is focused on Christ. It leads to Christ. It exalts Christ. Remember, Paul was not a follower of Jesus during Jesus' life on earth. He wasn't there when Jesus was raised unto the cross and raised from the dead and raised into heaven. Yet Paul points to the resurrection and the ascension as the ultimate expression of God's power. Paul here is a model for us. Like me, I'm sure you have heard many testimonies. Most testimonies are filled with I, me, my. Paul's testimony had none of this. Rather, his testimony is filled with God and Christ. Furthermore, most testimonies are filled with what God has done in my life for me. Again, this is not what Paul does. Rather, his testimony is about God's power through Christ. Do you see the difference? When we talk about the power of God, it needs to point to Jesus. It needs to exalt Jesus. It needs to proclaim Jesus. It's not about us. It is not about the things God has done through us. It is all about Jesus. Jesus needs to be our focus. But God does give us power. In verse 19, God tells us that his power is to those who believe. Does this mean that unbelievers don't have the power of God? Yes, because they haven't received Christ into their lives, who is an extension of his power. 
Without Christ, we are like the house in the beginning story that had lost its power. We have no source for our power, and we cannot run on our own power. Now, I think most of us in this room, which I know that we all do, have a cell phone or a laptop that we use on a daily basis. And it seems like I am always trying to find a source of power for my laptop or for my phone. Because the battery tends to die quickly and therefore needs a source of power to raise the charge. Our cell phone dies, our laptop dies if it doesn't get, char get charged. But we can stay charged through God's power because his power never dies. In Ephesians 3, 17, it says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundant, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. And so I ask you this morning in conclusion, are you relying on God's power this morning? Or are you relying on your own power? If we rely on our own strength and power, we can accomplish little. But if we rely on God's strength and power, we can accomplish so much more through him.